Welcome out to our Wednesday evening worship service tonight, but we've come to lift up the name of Jesus. Put your hands together as we sing it out. Yeah. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I will turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Well, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, sun shining down on me, the world's all that it should be, blessed be your name, and blessed be your name, on the road marked with suffering, there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name, oh every blessing. 
Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name. And you give. You give and take away. Blessed be your name, and you give, you give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, oh, blessed be your name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, oh, blessed be your glory. Name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be your glorious name. Yes, and we bless the name of Jesus today.
to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord you great are you Lord you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord in great
such a simple revelation, but it's so important to understand that it's his breath in our lungs. That everything just stops if he doesn't put it in our lungs. Life stops. He holds our lives in his hands. He's worthy to be praised. Every day as we come before him, honoring him and blessing him for all that he has done in our lives, uh, a song like that just reminds us of how good he is. And despite everything else that may be going on, difficulties we might be facing in life, at the end of the day, he is a good God. He is a faithful God, and he is guiding us and leading us, and we're so grateful to have the privilege of coming before his throne of grace. We want to pray for a couple of needs. Brother Joe Herrera needs continued healing from hip surgery. We want to pray for him. We want to pray for... Uh, Doralina Martinez continued healing uh, from COVID and continued healing for uh, Luz Urega, Uregi who has uh, cancer. I want to pray as well. Uh, just a tremendous resource for any prayer warriors that we have uh, on our website, door.church slash prayer. We, ha- we get prayer requests that come in all the time. And uh, for all of our prayer warriors, you know, you can go right on there and see the needs that uh, are not just in our congregation, but around uh, the world as people are sending in prayer requests. And so we want to just go before the throne of grace tonight. We want to believe God to have his way in our lives. We want to pray for the marriage retreat coming up this weekend, that God would be exalted and that our marriages would be edified and helped, that uh, there are people here tonight, you need a miracle in your marriage, uh, and God is going to work that this weekend through the word of God and some transformation taking place. You're believing God for that. Let's believe God to touch us this service. Let's open our hearts to him and to his word and ask God to speak to us tonight. Uh, Amen. Let's lift up our voices before the Lord. We're going to believe God to move in this place. I'm going to ask ask uh, uh, this evening, Brother Derek King, to come and open our service in prayer tonight. Father God, we're so grateful for your presence. We thank you, Lord God, that you are here tonight, Lord, to minister to us and speak to us. Uh, God, we're asking you to have your way in this place, Lord God. We need you. Uh, Lord, anoint your word as it goes forth, Lord. Challenge our hearts uh, and love. Oh, dear Lord, I pray for those that need healing, oh God, that you'll have your hand over them, oh God, that you'll just show miracles through their lives, oh God. I pray for those that are struggling with anything, oh God, that you'll just move through their lives, show a miracle because you are the one and only true God, oh God. I pray that this word will just speak to our hearts and speak wisdom into our hearts and we'll listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you. You can be seated this evening. We're grateful for all of you that are here tonight. Those of you that are participating with us online, we want to thank God uh, for you. We just want to give you a couple of announcements before we hear a report from last night's outreach. We, the main annou- announcement is marriage retreat starting tomorrow night with Pastor Greg Farrell at the Westin La Paloma. Uh, many of the couples here are staying there, but you do not have to be staying at La Paloma uh, to attend. And so if you are a married couple and you're not able to stay there, uh, you, they're open to everybody. And so you, everybody who's married, let me <laughs> clarify that, open to all married couples. Uh, and you can come uh, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. And then Friday night, we start at 6 o'clock. So if you go up to the Westin La Paloma, and uh, if you just put that in Google, and then you'll, the, once you get there, they'll direct you to what room we're in and give you all the details for that. So tomorrow night, 7, and then Friday night, 6 o'clock. And then uh, just to uh, remind you is we'll be back here Sunday morning, uh, 10 o'clock, and then Sunday evening, 7 o'clock. Pastor Greg Farrell will be with us for both of those services as well, and we're looking forward to all that God is going to do. Um, Last night, we had a tremendous outreach at Purple Heart Park. Uh, Pastor Gabe Ruby is going to come and give us a report on that. Uh, 
Amen. Last night, we had an outreach at Purple Heart Park right in the middle of the practices of the mighty Southeast Trojans. And um, Vision showed up. We had a band, Air 404, and that's uh, uh, Eli's group. And then Elisha's group, Desperados, also played. Um, they Both of them did a great job. It's so cool to hear just young dudes banging through some chords for Jesus and rocking out. Four people prayed uh, to receive Jesus last night. We, had, we got five people's contacts. What was, I think the coolest part was just seeing uh, the skate park get invaded just by randos. Just Christians walked in there, started talking to guys um, that are trying to bring back the Jenko jeans apparently. And there's people in there getting witness to and, and praying. And, uh, you know, hey, this generation, they're lost. But they are open, and uh, I want to thank God for everything that happened at Purple Heart Park. Pray for uh, Rita Ranch. Pray for that area of town. A lot of just blue-collar working-class folks living in that area, but they need Jesus, and we're going to do it again pretty soon. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. I want to ask the ushers to come this evening. It was tremendous last night uh, seeing just a whole nother generation uh, rising up. I mean, that's what our congregation is all about. We make disciples. We start young uh, from our children. And to see these kids, 14, 15 years old, uh, playing music in the park uh, as a witness, as evangelism, uh, tremendous. And, I mean, these, these kids, man, they're, they're getting good. And uh, they're, they're working on their craft because they want to be there uh, to uh, not just draw a crowd, but be able to minister to the crowd. I was listening to uh, the Orozco Dominguez band, uh, and man, I was like, man, I'm not into this kind of music, but they're good. Like, you can tell they're good. I mean, they're tight, and it's thrash heavy metal, just in case you wanted to know what music I'm not into, but... <laughs> I mean, they're up there, man, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> and, uh, but it was just an amazing thing to see a whole nother generation because I remember watching Pierce's father, George, 25 years ago on the drums, the Sons of Thunder, concerts, parks, everything, and just, and now to see his son starting his own music group 25 years later, and the vision continues, that's what we're a part of. And it's an amazing thing, privilege that we have. Amen. Let's give to the Lord tonight. Let's bring our tithes, offerings to the Lord. Let's bow our heads tonight. Brother Dean, would you pray for the offering? Oh, 
team this evening we appreciate you very much i mean we are very privileged to have all the way from west australia the thriving metropolis of bustleton <laughs> west australia uh pastor greg farrell i was just in sydney and he had preceded me in a revival there in in another church in sydney and so he was leaving uh flying out of sydney when i was flying into sydney and the thing that uh really caught my attention was all the pastors when I was talking to them they were just talking about how they just finished revival with Pastor Greg Farrell how blessed they were by his ministry I think the thing that I love most about Pastor Greg Farrell is how much he loves the word of God and how much he not just he doesn't just read it to preach it he reads it to feed his soul he digs deep he mines deep uh, uh, to get the gold, the nuggets out of the Word of God. And this evening, we have the privilege and this entire weekend, uh, tonight, tomorrow night, Friday, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night, to hear the Word of God from a man who loves the Word of God. So let's welcome him this evening as he comes. Hallelujah. I'm not going to say what a beautiful building because everybody says that. But it's a beautiful building. <laughs> Hallelujah. Great to have you in service on a Wednesday night. And uh, if I don't make any sense tonight, I have a reason. And we've just not long got off a plane and 30 hours of travelling. But who knows, that makes no difference. Is that right? If you have a Bible tonight, Mark chapter 14, if you want to go there, Mark chapter 14. And uh, again, I always appreciate the invitation to minister anywhere. Uh, especially in Tucson and uh, over the years you know I think I've said it before I always feel like we're amongst family here uh, coming into the building tonight I'm yet to have a tour but one of the first stops was just Pastor Warner's office and uh, it's just great to see Pastor Warner he's uh, he's like dad to me in so many different ways I really do appreciate him his longevity his ministry uh, various people here I've got to know my wife's with me this week because who knows, you can't, you can't do a marriage retreat without bringing your wife. Is that right? That's it. And behind every good man, there's a better woman. Is that right? Come on, you need... Hallelujah. Uh, tonight we want to just look at a very simple message this evening from uh, the book of Mark in chapter 14. And, um, you know, in COVID obviously changed a lot of things. And uh, for us, we became isolated from the world way down on that little island floating in the southern hemisphere. Uh, you know, we got cut off from the world big time. And for much two and a half years, we haven't been able to travel in or out of Australia. And so this is, this is our first trip out of Australia in a long time. And that changed a lot of things. It changed a lot of things in Australia, the way, way we do things. Uh, and one of the things that it changed that, you know, not a lot of people would think about, but... Uh, we have, you know, massive fruit growing areas like you do uh, here, no doubt, in certain parts of your country. Not far from where we are, there's a little town called Manjumup, and they are famous for all the fruit they produce. And generally what's happened over years and years and years is we have these people called backpackers. Do you have them here? And they come from Europe, and they come by the droves, and the way they uh, finance their lives while they're in Australia is they, they generally travel seasonally from place to place picking fruit, that's what they do. And you know, obviously the guys that produce the fruit, the farmers, they like that, they've had a constant workforce there to pick their fruit. And all of a sudden, bang, these backpackers couldn't come into Australia. And one of the crises we have, and we actually still have it now, is there is no one around to pick the fruit. And so you've got just tons of fruit, fruit's grown out of control, you know, fruit grows great in Australia, uh, but no pickers. And I'm not going to preach about laborers tonight. Some of you are, oh yeah, we got this sermon. No, 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 no. Just, just keep your mind engaged, all right? We're going somewhere else tonight. But uh, it was interesting. I was talking to a young couple and this lady, her, um, her father owns a massive uh, farm. They grow avocados in particular. And anyway, what's, what they've done to overcome the problem of backpackers because they can't get into Australia is some of the South Pacific nations which were COVID-free, the government did a deal with some of these South Pacific nations 
and was flying in lots and lots of Tongans, um, Vanuatu, people from Vanuatu, numbers of people from different islands, and they were bringing them in specifically to pick fruit, and you know, they'd make incredible money doing it, so they're a happy bunch. But this lady, was so, she said something so interesting to me. She said, it's amazing, she said, you can stand at our house, and there's this massive you know, property, hundreds of acres of these avocado trees, and she said, you can just about see the avocados coming off the trees, because unlike backpackers, these, these islanders, they work hard, man. And she said, the thing about them is that they sing while they work. And she said, on top of that, they sing gospel songs. And she said, so down in the valley, it's like she said, you can't see anything, but you can hear coming from the valley all these voices. Like across the, 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 the farm, you'll hear this amazing grace. And you'll hear it right across the whole farm. Harmonies. And, as it's ha- and these guys will work 10, 12 hours a day. And they come out of there smiling. And, and she, she's telling me this. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. Rather than these, you know, whinging backpackers. That's hard. You guys don't pay us enough. These guys are singing while they work. And I, I'm going to minister this evening a, a sermon. The title is simply this. It's easier to march to music. Far easier in life to march to music. And I think we about a certain grace that we see in Jesus that is absolutely necessary if you want the the oil, the, the oil to lubricate the cogs of your life. Who likes life to run a bit smoother? It's just, I mean, life's just not this grind, you know? And Jesus presents us with an incredible grace here in this passage of Scripture that we'll see. And I'm telling you, if we are not this kind of person, employ tonight this into your life, and I'm telling you, the oil on your cogs... And all of a sudden, you'll find it's a whole lot easier to march to music. Let's have a look. Um, we're going to go to Mark 14, starting verse 1. New King James Version tonight. It says this, After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar in the, uh, of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the world, that this woman, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her." What do you think just on this little picture that we have here in Scripture? And the picture, as you study this text, as you find it in other Gospels, for instance, you'll find this same story uh, in John chapter 12. What happens uh, if you find a story in a Gospel, uh, make sure you don't just get to another Gospel and go, oh yeah, this, this, I've read this before, it's in another one. If you actually start to layer them, the picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Because all these writers, they're seeing the synoptic gospels, three of them, they see from a different angle and they give you a different color and a different angle and you see things. And this is a powerful story that goes on here. And there are things, like I say, uh, 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 here to see. And what you see in this text for a start is that you'll see there's two kinds of people in, in, in life. And they are either minus people, people that leave you a little poorer when they walk away from you, or plus people who leave you a little richer. You know, it's in life, you can hang around with certain people and you walk away sensing encouragement, right? You were discouraged maybe, and you know, you've had the courage knocked out of you, but you just hang out with this person for a little while, and next thing you know, you've got courage again, because they plussed something to you. 
You might not be feeling uh, uh, too good, you're depressed, but next thing you hang around with somebody with a little inspiration, uh, and we know that word inspire, in spirit, in breathe, to inhale, it's like they breathe life into your lungs and you walk away going, oh man, that was great. Who knows what I'm talking about? Those kinds of people in life, but you know, we also get the minus folks. Like I say, and, and here's a woman here, she's pouring out this oil, it's, it's an incredible thing that's going on here. And right in amongst it, instead of this, this appreciation for what should be happening, she finds this sharp criticism. And, you know, these actions are completely misinterpreted, aren't understood at all by the person that's bringing them in particular, which we know was Judas, he headed up the whole thing. And so what you see here is these, these critics, something glorious is going on, but the critic all of a sudden takes away what's glorious or tries to unless until Jesus guarded the situation. You know, years ago, Tina and I were uh, pastoring, we're pioneering a church, a little place called Mandra. It's about probably two hours north of us. And, um, you know, here we were, we were 26, 27, barely saved ourselves. I think we've been saved three years. We're pioneering a church. We're there with our, with our little family, little girls, uh, um, you know, we're just doing all the things, trying to, to see God do a work there. And we, we, we were having fun, let me tell you. There was, there was stuff going on and people getting saved and all young people. And there was Tina and I, were the, us and one other couple were the only married people in the church. And, and it was all these young folks were coming in, getting saved. And we we're having a great time. And one morning, there's this couple came in and uh, they were sort of older than us, probably maybe 40, something like that. Really old, you know. And... Uh, Back then, 40 seemed so old. <laughs> but what happens, is that they come in and they're sitting there in the back row and, and you know, we're you know, going through the thing and I'm, I'm back, this is back in the day when you don't have any musicians, it's just you and a guitar and you're beating the thing half to death trying to make it sound because you don't have a PA and, and you're just hammering this thing and, you know, I'm, I'm running through the service, I'm, you know, prayer, announcements, you know, taking an offering, all that sort of stuff. I, I preach and we had visitors like young folks there and uh, I'll never forget, you know, these three young people responded to the altar call. They came down. Uh, you know, we're praying with these folks. They're getting... I mean, this is, this is every young pastor's dream. Yeah. You know, these people giving their... I'm, I'm like halfway to heaven. Like, this is what it's all about. Whether you have a PA or not, who cares? You know what I mean? Like today, everybody wants to go out and have everything that opens and shuts. There was a day when you, it's just your guitar, your plectrum and you. Can you say amen? That's, that's just what it was. And the gospel works. And here's these three people, and I'm serious. I, I, I get up from praying with one of them, because you know you don't have enough people to pray with them. And I, I am seriously, I'm like, I'm halfway to heaven. And all of a sudden, this 40-year-old visitor comes up to me. He's got his wife standing like right next to him. And he goes, what do you mean your church in Zimbabwe? I said, pardon? <laughs> and he points out my massive error that when I said, let's pray for our church in Zimbabwe, our church in Zimbabwe, that it's not our church, it's God's church. <laughs> oh, look, I'm so sorry, man. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Like, bro, there's three people just gave their lives to Jesus. It's me and my wife and these kids here. We're doing everything we can. And you are going to point out, you are going to sharply criticize me. You are going to take away from this glorious atmosphere. You big minus person, you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, are you serious, mate? And he was serious. That's the problem. That is the problem. He wasn't joking. You know, what you sense there, and this is the grace that we want to talk about tonight, is zero appreciation. None. Not one ounce of appreciation for what was going on right there in that place. You know, the word appreciate, it simply means this, Webster's Dictionary, it means to increase in value. When you appreciate something, you add value to it. When, you, when you're a plus person, that's what you're doing. I mean, you think of any, any assets we have, we hope they appreciate, which is to grow in value. Would you say yes? 
Listen to another definition of the word appreciate. It means to grasp the nature, worth, quality or significance of something, to judge with heightened perception or understanding, to be fully aware or to recognise with gratitude. You know, tonight, as we're worshipping God, to me, what we're doing here is we're appreciating God. When Pastor Garrett got up here tonight and he simply said, you know what, the fact that we're singing this song, that we appreciate every breath that we take. Because, you know, one, one man said, if, you want to get, if God wanted to get man's attention, all you have to do is turn the oxygen off for two minutes. True. But we just breathe it in and breathe it out and we don't really care. And this is why when you think about this grace of appreciation, uh, to me, that's the music in life. That's what enables us to you know, go through life, some of the tough stuff of life, is just to know sometimes that we are appreciated. You think so much of life is mundane, isn't it? I mean, really, let's get down to it. I mean, the you know, mountaintops are little things. Valleys are deep things. And, and the idea that, you know, I think of, uh, you know, mothers, just mothers every day. I'm, I'm watching some of my children uh, uh, as they're having kids. And, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate what they're doing. I appreciate my own mother. Uh, I appreciate my wife, you know, because my wife, she's given her life to her kids. And I've seen my wife, the, the relentless care and love for her kids that is not just, you know, it was not just when they're in diapers. No, it's still going on. Uh, my eldest daughter's 41, and I see my wife still cares for that daughter as much as she's ever cared for her. Uh, she now pours out that same care and value on their children. We have 10 grandchildren, and I watch her, and she's just endless. And I have this incredible appreciation for my wife who never stands on a, on a platform, who doesn't speak, who never gets the... And here, and here she comes. Never. But I tell you, I have a deep appreciation. I value her contribution to life, even though for many, when they turn around and say, and what do you do? And she doesn't go, oh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, whatever, you know, some sort of, I don't know, come up with some qualification... She just goes, I'm my mother. But the fact is, to me, any woman that commits her life to motherhood with a heart, I'm like, you're looking at a hero right there. Dead set, man, she is a hero. It's true, yeah, give him a hand. And yet at the same time, who understands that the man that gets up every morning that has a, has a relationship with God, that gets down to pray for his wife, pray for his family, goes off, works the same job. That could be shoveling sand into a, into a mixer. It could be laying a brick. It could be laying under a car, fixing some greasy thing. Who knows what? But they do it day in, day out, week after week, after month after month. I have a guy in my church, his name is Perry. Uh, they call him the car whisperer. Wow, oh, man, is that, is that anything like a brain surgeon? Quiet. But this guy, you know, I, I so appreciate Perry. Why? Because he just does his thing, you know. He's, a, he's a, a very, very good at what he does. Uh, he's a father of four children. Uh, uh, he just, he's, just, he's one of those faithful guys. It's like when I go to prayer in the morning, it's like, you know, who remembers the old Bugs Bunny movies with the, the two uh, sheepdogs? And if, I don't know if any of you guys remember those things. And they clock on, clock off, you know. And the poor old coyote, you know, the guy's about to hit him in the head and, the, and all of a sudden the bell goes and, and he sort of drops him and goes and clocks on. The other guy comes and grabs him and clock it, bang, and he hits him. And who remembers that? I'm glad somebody does. But see, if Perry's one of those guys for me. He, he's like we, we sort of high five as he comes out of prayer and I go into prayer every, every day. He's just there. He's praying. He knows that, you know what, nothing changes unless men pray. And he's not the, your guy that's jumping around. He's not playing a guitar. He's just, he's just such an incredibly faithful man, man of God, father, uh, man in our church. I have such appreciation for this guy because I know what life is costing him. I understand. And see, a word of appreciation, you know, for those you know, in particular who faithfully do the same thing day in and day out, uh, you know, for those people... It's a whole lot easier 
if somebody just turns around sometimes and says, hey man, I really appreciate what you're doing. They might not even use those words. But just to say, you know what, what you do in life is so valuable to us. It's, it's a powerful grace. It's, we're not talking flattery here. Flattery, one man said, is simply a, a veiled insult. You know, it's, it's, we have this term in Australia, I don't know if you use it here, uh, you know, people flatter people, uh, but it's all actually self-centred because they flatter them to get something from them. And we have this saying, yeah, you're just greasing me up. Do you have that saying? It's like, you know, you're just trying to get something and so they, they will say nice things about you or, you know, praise is, is something else. Praise is very momentary. You know, you did something and, wow, man, thanks for doing that. That's, appreciation is far deeper than that. It's like, you know, we can praise God, but there, there's that part of worship that's like real appreciation. Grateful for what Jesus has done. I mean, really grateful for what Jesus has done. Grateful for what he gives us. Grateful for the gifts he gives us. You know, my, my mother, she's 87 years old, and uh, she said to me recently, she goes, I can't do much anymore. But I can pray. And I said, Mum, you know what? You have no idea how much I appreciate your prayers. Yeah, yeah. And she told me a little while back, she said, you know what? When, um, when I was pregnant with you, and she never told me this for years. She, she said that when I was pregnant with you, I already had four boys. And she said at the time it was sociably sort of unacceptable to have any more than four children. And she said, the doctor actually asked me if I wanted to abort you. She said, the thought wasn't even in my mind. And he's sewing this into me. And she said, I was in shock. She said, not a chance. Not a chance. And she said, you know, all of my life, I've prayed that God would give you inspiration and revelation. And, you know, when I, when I stand up to preach anywhere, I appreciate the fact this isn't Greg Farrell's self-made man. No, I appreciate the fact there's my mother that you would never see because she's just getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> but I appreciate the fact that that lady, every morning of her life, has got down and prayed for me. That's the reason we're saved today, I believe, because she prayed for us. Not seen, but I tell you what, deeply appreciated. Deeply appreciated, deeply valued. Because again, you know, praising people, flattering people, that's cheap in a sense. Praise, thank you. We need to do that from time to time. But appreciation, what it does, it grasps, it really enters into the real value of things. And it comes from a, a real genuine understanding. It's like an understanding is to put yourself in the place of somebody else. It's actually to, to be there. And I think we probably don't even realise it sometimes, but one of the greatest needs of the human heart is to be loved and appreciated. It's one of the greatest needs there is. One man said there are no greater heroes in the world than those who have to toil for years without a single appreciative word. They're the greatest heroes. And this is something, again, as we consider Jesus and the grace that he has, we see this at work because... I don't know if you realise or not, this is an amazing little situation that's going on in this room. And if you pick this same story up in John 12, uh, here we find that Mark has it at Simon the leper's house. And, you know, if you can actually stop and, let's say, appreciate what's actually happening in this scene, because you've got Jesus come to this house. This is not the Last Supper, as that we find in, for instance, in John 13, but this is what I think we would call the last dinner. And what's happening at this dinner, if you look at the New Living Translation, it says, it's beautiful actually, it says that they came together to honour Jesus. And who knows tonight, really, that's what we're doing here. We come together to worship, to honour Jesus, to lift him up, to value him. And that's what this dinner was about. It was an appreciation dinner. And if you stop and think who was at the dinner you really start to get it because, A, you've got Simon the leper. Now, who understands lepers don't usually have dinner parties? Or if you get an invitation from one, you don't usually go. You know what I'm saying? Lepers, you know, they're lonely folks. They hang out of town. But here's Simon is having a dinner party at his house. 
So, you know, for us, we start to think from a theological point of view, we think, okay, uh, you know, he was a leper, leper, synonymous of sin so often in Scripture. What does sin do? Sin separates. Uh, and so this guy for years has been separated from community. He hasn't been to dinner. And all of a sudden, this guy, because of Jesus, is sitting at a table having dinner with other people. Separated and joined back together, reconciled. This guy's at dinner having a wonderful appreciation dinner. But see, if you look across the table, there's another guy who's got a really, he's got a radical testimony. Because his name was Lazarus. And he's a guy that had been dead for four days. Can you imagine his Simon the leper, you know, so Laz, I heard you went well. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's pretty crook. Pretty crook, yeah. Like how crook? Uh, dead. Dead. <laughs> what do you mean dead? Well, you know, how dead? Well, like dead, stinketh dead. <laughs> like four days dead. Really, bro? What's that? Well, tell me what was it like, you know? Now imagine this, the leper and the dead guy. <laughs> Let's get back to the church for a second, right? We're gathered together to do what? Honour Jesus, yeah. right? What's, what's in the church? Well, there's a whole bunch of people that were separated from God and from each other. They're sitting there, and now we've got this other guy who is dead. And he's sitting there, and he doesn't even stinketh. <laughs> Which is what? Well, it's gospel stuff, isn't it? It's from death to life. Right? That's what the church is. for people reconciled to God and to each other that were dead and now are alive in Christ. Then there's this other woman, and she's running around. Her name's Martha. And if you check her story out, you know, go back to John 11, well, she's a, she's a woman that was whinging about everything. I told my sister to come and help me. <laughs> right? I mean, it was, only, you know, it was only Jesus for dinner. Right? And she's whinging about that. But now she's got not just this crowd, but she's got all the disciples there. There's a whole crowd of them there. And she's serving everywhere. And guess what? You do not hear a whinging word out of her. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is. Sinners reconciled to God, people that have gone from uh, death to life, and here's this service that comes out of this woman. No whinging here. She's singing while she works. She's doing her thing. And then on top of that, not only is this, this, this you know, unbridled service, but now you've got this other woman who, who just sort of chops into the picture named Mary, and she's breaking this alabaster box pouring out this fragrant oil. I mean, think about this for a second, because now, uh, you know, that right there represents worship. It's everything she is. This wasn't just any old oil. This wasn't just some nice little perfume you picked up at the shop. This stuff here, this anointing oil, and, you know, I, I'll, I could show you this with another sermon altogether, but this anointing oil was meant for her burial. And here she is, she, she understands what's going on. She's sensitive to the atmosphere. She knows where Jesus is going. She has a revelation and she pours out this gift. It's worship. What a church this is. Can you say me seriously? Check that church out. I mean, it's all going on. And someone's probably praying with three young people at the altar. And some loser... Oh, 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 it could have been it could have been sold and given to the poor. <laughs> you total loser. I mean seriously, mate, are you for real? Throw this guy out. Who is this? Does not in any way appreciate what is going on. Not in the slightest. And you think about that, what what is that, man? What is wrong with this guy? Well, for a start, I think old Judas had a few narcissistic qualities. Because Judas is the guy that I think probably more than anything would think I'm entitled to that oil, not him. Well, that should be my oil. He wasn't, he wasn't concerned about the poor. It's like, no, this is a waste. We could use this for something else. Mainly me. He, he's the guy that wants to be the bride at every funeral and the corpse at every... I mean, sorry, the bride at every wedding... <laughs> And the corpse at every funeral. I hope it doesn't go that way. It's totally self-centered. He's entitled to this stuff. No one else is. 
He had no heart at all for what this woman was doing. Rather than appreciate this, he depreciates it, he, he deprecates it. It's like value goes down. See, people that, that carry a spirit of entitlement, they have no idea of the price that things cost. You know, that when I walk in here tonight, I'm sitting here. It was my first, you know, I've been talking to Pastor Warner. I walk in here and sat here and I just began to look at your building. And, um, you know, I, I don't, believe it or not, I don't come in and see, oh, nice screens. Oh, nice this, nice that. What I see is the actual building. And the reason I appreciate it, I don't walk in and go, hmm, could have been a different colour. Hmm, <laughs> the lights, hmm, I don't know about the lights, hmm. They are the trimmings of life. I'm talking about the structures. I'm talking about the blood, sweat and tears. I'm talking about all that kind of stuff that got involved in that part of the building. I'm also understanding there's a whole bunch of people here that you have given something that you could have put on your table or put some flash paint job on your car or bought something for yourself, but you haven't. You went, you know what? No, we believe in reaching the world for Jesus. We believe in, in conferences and having people back here and space and to facilitate. You know what the word facilitate means? It means to make things easy. That's, that's what it is. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, for all of us, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make life, in a sense, easier, better. We're trying to oil the cogs of other people's lives to bring refreshing somehow. But that comes at a cost. And I appreciate that. But you'll find some people, it's like they, 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 would, they would walk in and, well, I don't know the seats. I don't know about the seats. Do you, do you like the way the seats are? I don't know. There's, there's far more going on. Can you say amen? And so again, we, we become not sometimes just entitled, but we become familiar with things. And we can become so familiar with other people supporting us, giving, that we, we, we don't appreciate we don't think enough through things. We don't take time to consider. And instead, if not careful, we go through life as consumers rather than contributors. That's what happens. We're just consuming everything, you know, moving across the land. And, and the only time we ever hear from you in, when, is when there's not enough for you. And that, that's a horrible thing. You know, kids, kids are born consumers. Who's figured that out? Is that right? I mean, seriously, you just keep tipping in buckets full of money or food or whatever you want to just keep. It's gone. Right? But you know, one of the great revelations for us is watching our kids. Uh, our youngest daughter just had a first child about 10 months ago. And I've watched her and I've heard from her mouth things that I've never heard from her before. Because she's come to a revelation of having this little baby that does not comply and you feel like going, and it won't for a long time. <laughs> right. But just, I, just I, I listen to her talk to teens sometimes on the phone, and I, I'm like, listen to this girl. There's something deep in her that is not just caring for her own child, but it's having a revelation of how she's been cared for. And it's, it's deep. But it's changed the way she communicates with us. It's changed her relationship with me because she understands there's all sorts of sacrifice that has gone on to kept her breathing all these years. See, it's generally the ones that, that pay the price in one way or another that understand and we hope in time that others catch on because they get involved. And this idea of, you know, just appreciating every person. Every person, you know, it's like, it's like when we have outreaches and stuff. You know, I have a whole sermon. It's called um, The Sport of Christianity. And it's all about the idea that we can, we can make anything. Us human beings, we can make anything into a sport. Have you noticed that? It's like, you know, who knows a chainsaw? I use a chainsaw quite a bit because we burn wood in a fire. Does remember, anybody remember what they are? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm out there on a chainsaw quite a bit because my wife, she's, um, she gets cold and uh, she burns on average about a tree a week. And so I know all about a chainsaw. But it's, it's incredible to me that people now have chainsaw drags. 
And they have these chainsaws with whopping exhaust systems and... And it's... And they cut in little two inches slices off the end of a log and they race them. And meanwhile, their wife's at home freezing to death because she's got no wood. <laughs> well, we're good at that stuff. And we can sometimes, if not careful, it's like, yeah, we're doing the outrage and it's all about the music of this and that and everything else. And all of a sudden, someone responds. And it's like, yeah, well, how did I play? I don't really care, bro. It, it, was, it was actually all about them. It was about them. Because, see, one sinner costs more than me learning how to play the guitar. It costs the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And so the idea, see, when we, when we sort of stop and move away from ourselves and have a deeper appreciation for what's going on, and all of a sudden you start to realise that all heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. How come? Because they know the price that was paid for that one sinner. That one day their, their glorious God left heaven, put off his privileges and came and lived like us. Heaven saw that happen. And they're blown away at the price of a sinner. And so should we be. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly appreciative of people that just come to church on a Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. I am. I really am. I appreciate you folks tonight. And I don't just say that lightly. I know what it means to get to church on a Wednesday night sometimes. Yeah. You know, you've got little kids. I know what it means. You know, how come we had little kids? You know, they weren't born 35 years old. No. I remember my wife, you know, you know just with all these little girls and, and what she's done and, and how she'd have them dressed and ready to go and in the car and, you know, off to prayer and all that. I know what that costs. And that's why it's, to this day, I appreciate every person that walks into church anytime. I really do. Because I know in one way or another, it costs me here. But it's about what are we doing? Coming together to honour Jesus. That's what we're doing. And see, when it comes all right down to it, we can take a leaf out of Jesus' book here in our text because what we see is Jesus was a plus person. When the devil is trying to rob, rob this whole situation, beautiful picture. Seriously, when you sit down and you ponder that picture around that table, that's the sort of place you want to be right there. And all of a sudden, this guy just steps in the middle, inspired by the devil, and tries to literally minus the whole thing of absolute beauty and joy and worship. And here's Jesus. He, he steps in and he defends this woman. He says, hey, you, out of here, buddy. You don't have no idea what this woman's doing. You're so self-centered. You have no idea. This isn't about you. Because who understands, you know, I think it was John Stott, he was asked the question, uh, how would you describe Christianity in its essence? And he made this statement, he said, Christianity is the decentralization of self. It's a beautiful statement. And this is what Jesus does. He, he moves this guy, tried to shift the center away from him. And he brings it back to this woman's incredible act. And he restores value to what he was trying to steal value from. And what he's doing is he's appreciating what's happening, adding value. You think about the woman with the two mites. And nobody realized what she was doing. Jesus was the one that sees this woman. She's come with the two little copper coins. And, and you know, at the, um, at the temple, there was, a, a boat. there was two boxes. There was one there that would basically went to the temple and to the work of God there. Uh, the other one was a box that went to the poor. And if you think about this woman, she's a poor little old lady and she comes to the temple. She has two coins. Uh, I would say she probably dropped one in one box and one in the other. And in that one movement, one movement, what did she do? She loved God, which is the house of God. And she loved a neighbor, the poor people. And she loved God and her neighbor. She fulfilled the law in one act. And Jesus says to everybody, he goes, Whew, have a look at that little girl there. Nobody even took any notice whatsoever, but he said, that little lady there, she gave her whole livelihood to fulfill the word of God. She's given more than anybody here. And he adds value, just like he added value to this lady that we're still talking about today. We're still talking about a woman who had two mites. We're still talking about her. He's lifted these people up out of the mess 
so we can appreciate them and we can appreciate others. He speaks of these very, very simple things to me, but they're profound. In you know, Mark 9.41, he says, Forever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ. As surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Jesus appreciates every little act. Why? Because he loves and he understands. Let me go back to my mother for a second because she's, uh, she's funny. You know? I go to her house now. And my dad passed away 18 years ago. She's been living on her own pretty much the whole time. And uh, I go into her house and I just sort of look around her house. And she had seven sons and finally a daughter to give her some sanity. And, uh, you know, all of us, you know, went to, like, you know, at school, I don't know if you'd call it the same, we went to metalwork classes and woodwork classes and stuff like that. And you can imagine seven boys, how many things they have turned out of metalwork and woodwork, right? Now, I like, I, I, have a real, I, I work with wood, I love good quality uh, workmanship, furniture, stuff like that. And you, know, you ask my wife, there are times that I've embarrassed her because I've gone into someone's house and seen this incredible table or something like that, and next thing I'm lying on the floor, <laughs> under the table, looking at the joinery, thinking, that's incredible. Her dad has a 14th century table, I remember lying underneath it, just going, it's like, I thought he got saved. What, what happened? You know? <laughs> so here it is. I like that sort of stuff. And when I go into my mother's house, there's this table that I made when I was nine years old that I'm so ashamed of. <laughs> Dad said, I'm so ashamed of this table. Because our teacher, his name was Mr. Tampolini. He should have been a hairdresser, not woodwork. But we were using this uh, like compressed fibre board stuff. And it was obviously off cuts because the wood grain went the wrong way. Cheap rubbish. And that was the tabletop of this little coffee table. And the edging, rather than having nice, you know, at least solid timber edging and mitre and everything, it just had this really cheap, like plasticky tin stuff nailed on the edge. And if you turned it upside down, it had these three, uh, four metal brackets with three screws in each one that you just screw into the chipboard. And then these, you know, pre-made bought legs with threads on the end that you screw them in there. It is the most disgustingly cheap, horrible coffee table you can possibly imagine. And my mother has had that in her house for 52 years. Like, I want to go in there, mum, mum, just throw it out. Or at least put Steve's name on it or something. <laughs> but, you know, for my mum, she's not looking at the grain going the wrong way. She's not looking at the screw-in legs. She's not looking for any of that. She's looking at that and said, Greg made that. And I love him. And I appreciate that mess. Can you say Amen. You know, everybody might not do everything as perfect as we want them to. Right, right. Let me tell you, but when they gave their heart to it, appreciate it. Can you say amen? You know, have a look around, folks. Just have a look at people. Think about it. Think their life through. It doesn't take that long. I mean, we spend a lot longer just scrolling nothing. Can you say amen? Scroll some people's lives and just tell them maybe someday, hey, listen, I really appreciate what you do around here. You know, this church doesn't run on its own. There are, there, it's, it's a microcosm of lives. And just to simply say to somebody, you know what? I really appreciate it, bro. And not just say it. Name something real personal. That you understand what they do. And that one way or another, you're supporting us all to live. Can you say amen? Do unto others. Do it. Don't wait for somebody to come, oh, I really appreciate Oh, I really appreciate you too. No, 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 you do it. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I'm telling you, man, talk about music to march to changes all of life. Yeah. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer tonight. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed just for a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do appreciate, really do appreciate you being in service tonight and being with us. And maybe, you know, maybe you're here tonight as a, a first time visitor. I appreciate the fact you've come out to church on a Wednesday night. 
it, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that you've stepped into this building, you've maybe come an invitation, maybe you've just, you know, off the net, you've, you've seen advertising, someone's invited you. Who knows how you got here, but you're here. Let me tell you something. The greatest thing that's ever happened in our world is Jesus Christ. I mean, you go back to this story, this leper guy, he was so separated from people. Unless he had a miracle, nothing was going to change. He would stay that way. And we, all of us here tonight, doesn't matter who we are, doesn't matter if we you know, came from a good place, bad place, doesn't matter who we are. God loves us. And the Bible says this, it says that he proved this to us. It wasn't just words. But God demonstrated, that's an action, he demonstrated his love toward us. That while we're yet sinners, lepers, Christ died for us. And if you're wondering if anybody loves you or values your life, let me tell you, God does. And he showed that in Jesus dying upon a cross. And if you would be here tonight, that's you, and you'd say, you know what, Pastor, I want to give my life. I'm done with the camp, the leper camp, I'm done with that. I want to come to Jesus tonight. I want to give you an opportunity just to lift your hand. Someone can pray with you this evening. And you can come to know Jesus Christ in a real way. Yes, died on a cross, but rose from the dead. He's here tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll speak, if you'll pray, you'll know his power in your heart. You'll find forgiveness and power to live for him. You're here tonight, never given your life to Christ, never been born again. But you'd lift your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. I'm here tonight. I need Jesus Christ. I want you to lift your hand right up high so I can see it. Lift your hand right up high and say, yeah, that's me. God, help me. Save me. Lift your hand right up high tonight. Here you are on a Wednesday night. You're at the crossroads of life. You can carry on and go nowhere. I'm talking tonight about a change, complete radical change of life. It's a turning point. You can say, yes, that's me. You lift your hand right up high. Lift your hand right up high tonight. And you can just spend a, a few moments. Amen, I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you. Appreciate that hand. Appreciate your honesty tonight. Others, you join this one. Say, yeah, that's me. You know, I appreciate this brother here would lift his hand, you know. I remember when I lifted my hand. There was 10 people in church. Four of us lifted our hands that day. And I remember that, that humility. Just, yeah, that's me. I need something beyond myself. You lift your hand, join this one. Join this one. Anyone at all tonight? Maybe you're backslidden. You've come into church tonight. And if you'd just be open and honest with God, you'd say, God, I've, I'm not... I'm not living for you. I'm living for myself. I want to get my heart right tonight. And you lift your hand quickly. Right across this building, you lift your hand quickly. Lift your hand right up high and say, yeah, that's me. God help me. Amen. That one that lifted your hand, you're going to come out of your seat tonight. You're going to have a brother pray with you. Just come out of your seat for a second. Have a brother come and pray with this brother here. Hallelujah. As our brother comes... Let's all tonight, you know, this, this grace of God. We see this grace in Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Brother's going to pray with you right there. You see this grace in Jesus adding value where the devil's trying to steal away. You might say in your heart, well, nobody really appreciates me. It's a tough, it's a tough gig. Marching with no music. I understand that. But never forget Jesus has died for us. And you might go, yeah, I know. Well, listen, that's the ultimate. God loves us. But make it your point to begin to appreciate others. A word here and there. Some thoughtfulness. Some considerations. I tell you, it's, it's incredible how it changes things in your own heart, changes the lives of others. We talk about, you know, having a powerful ministry. You'd be blown away at some words of appreciation. God's speaking to us tonight about these things. Those simple things I understand. Those simple things. 
But they're powerful things when we employ them, when we consider it. Don't take things for granted. Don't become familiar with things, familiar with people. I'm going to spend some time around this altar tonight. Let's all stand together. Our brother's going to lead us in worship. Come find a place to pray. And let God help you tonight. Amen. Your grace and mercy Pray like never Thank you, Father. Give you praise and glory, Lord, and honor. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 You know, we know it. You know, the golden rule, do unto others. Can I, can I say, do unto others? as you'd have them do. Oh, I don't have any friends. Be friendly. Be friendly. You know, Jesus said, you can be my friends. He said, if you lay your lives down. But what did he say? I've already, I've already laid mine down. It's like he was doing that towards people. If you feel like you're unappreciated, start to appreciate some people. I'm telling you, it, it comes back. Can you say amen? Seriously, if we would live life like this, like just, just do it, man. Do it to other people. It's giving. That's what it is. Just giving. And it's far more blessed to give than receive. I mean, we're going to worship the Lord again. Pastor is going to come. Pastor Garrett's going to come. We're going to have a great time at the marriage retreat. Really do encourage you to be there. Even if you're not staying at the La Paloma, come along. And let's believe God to help and uh, intervene in all of our lives. We all need help. Amen. Let's, let's worship as Pastor Garrett comes. Hallelujah. Thank God for that word tonight, a word in due season, and we're looking forward to what God is going to do over the next couple nights for all the married couples. Remember, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock on Friday night. If you forget what time it is, just check the app. The church app has the times on there as well. If you're not staying, as Pastor Farrell said, uh, but you are a married couple, you're free to come. Please come. Don't miss out on this opportunity. 7 o'clock tomorrow, 6 o'clock Friday. Amen. Our heads are bowed. Uh, this evening, 
We're going to uh, dismiss in prayer. Brother Mike McIntosh, would you lift your voice and dismiss us this evening? Spirit, touch your church.